millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because, let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high-quality, grass-fed, and grass-finished beef, organic chicken, pork-raised crate-free, and wild-caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm. And use code ETM to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Hey, I'm Shauna Compton Game. This is Millennial Money. And today we have a whole Ask Shauna episode. The questions we're going to answer is how much should I have invested at certain ages? Hmm, inquiring minds. And should I make weekly credit card payments? Another awesome question. Millennial Money with Shauna Compton Game. It will expand your brain. You guys are awesome. Really, I just have to tell you, you send the most incredible Ask Shauna questions in. Some of them really blow my mind, but I think more than anything, Uh, What gets me excited is that a lot of you are really thinking about your money in a different way, thinking about approaching it in a different way, having a little fun with it, which is the whole purpose of this podcast. And I I feel like you're really, you know, again, engaging with your finances, maybe in a way that you haven't before. And I certainly do not have all the answers. I am an expert, but I don't have every single answer. So I think it's really important that you ask lots of questions to a lot of different people and get, you know, different variations, different answers, because as I've said so many times, you're probably getting sick and tired of hearing me say this, that money is not a one size fits all. So what works for you today may not work for you tomorrow. And certainly what works for your friends or your boyfriend or your parents or your sister or your brother, whatever it may be, is likely not going to be the same strategy or suggestion that works for your particular situation. So it's really important to listen to any money advice or money strategies or money tips and take it all just with a grain of salt. You know, I I think if it if it opens up a place in your head where it makes talking about money, thinking about money more approachable, maybe more exciting, maybe more uh, just something where you feel more in control of your finances, then like my job is done, right? So today we have a couple of really great questions to, you know, ponder, to talk about on this episode. The first question comes from Jason and he says, I'm a relatively new listener two months in and I've since become a religious listener. Forgive me if this is already a topic that you've already covered, but I couldn't seem to find one in the archives discussing how much one should have saved by age 30. That is, what's is one's value, savings, retirement, investments, assets, etc. by age 30. 
Upon scouring the web, I get conflicting answers with the consensus being, by age 30, you should have saved one time your gross annual salary. Or by age 30, sorry, you should have up to half of your gross annual salary. I realize answers to such questions as this one varies depending on your situation, but I was just hoping you could provide some insight so I know how I match up, even though I think I'm likely behind. And so before we dive into that question, I just kind of want to frame this question and the answers around some interesting statistics. So according to an article in Market Watch, most of you probably don't read this, this is publication a lot of us uh, financial experts read, but they had some really interesting data the, the other day that I think Jason might help, you know, frame your frame the answer to this or help you figure out, you know, uh, where you actually stand. So in 1900, the average life expectancy was 47 years, only 47 years, only 100,000 Americans actually lived to age 85. That's pretty shocking because if you think about it, I mean, yeah, that was a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago. In with that short of life expectancy, I think, you know, when we look at it through that that lens, it makes sense that you know, when social security was started, it was only supposed to last a certain period of time and that people had these robust pension plans from work where essentially you worked for this company and they provided you a retirement benefit for the rest of your life. So it's not like today when you stop working for a company, you have to figure out what the heck you're going to do for, you know, the rest of 20, 30 years and how in the world are you going to have enough money to fund that? So another statistic by 2010, the number of people over 85 years old had grown to 5.5 million and one of, when was one of the fastest growing segments of our population. So obviously the trend is that we're getting older and we're living, I should say, longer and longer and longer. And by 2030, as the last baby boomers turn 65, Older adults are expected to reach 20% of the population, and by 2050, 19 million people will be in the 85-plus age group. So we go from 1900, where the average life expectancy was only 47 years old, to 2050, which if you think about it, isn't that far away, where 19 million people will be 85 years or older. And the statistics are that, you know, because people are healthier, you could see yourself living well into your 90s, if not your hundreds. That's pretty much the life expectancy of somebody who is, you know, maybe early 20s, even 30s. You know, we're looking at 90 years life expectancy. And unfortunately, for men, your life expectancy is usually shorter than us women, which is ironic, I think, because women earn less, right? We're earning less across the board. Uh, doesn't matter the color of our skin, uh, where we come from, we're earning less than men. So we're earning less, we're going to live longer, and we start and stop in our careers. So, I mean, for women, like, we just have the complete crapshoot. You know, we got to get our stuff together because we got a lot of things coming at us, but I digress. Um, so we talk about Social Security, which we don't talk a lot about on this podcast, but when it was created back in 1935, it was created for benefits starting at age 65, which was the average life expectancy then was around 61 years old, right? So they created the system in 1935 thinking, well, most people aren't even going to take advantage of it because most people are going to pass away around 61 years old. So it was genius, you know, when it, when it came out at the time. I mean, you know, it was, uh, let's find a way to help people beef up their retirement that was, you know, kind of a government-sponsored program, but we know that most of the people won't even get there. Well, now think about it, you know, Social Security hasn't been updated. It hasn't been, I mean, the the most revolutionary update was that they moved the, um, you know, the full retirement age to 67 years old. So, I mean, that's just not that revolutionary, but it's really not done anything. In fact, we were taxing the benefits more and, you know, the idea that benefits might not even be there when when you need them. It's just, it's it's crazy, you know, it's, it's really a kind of backward system. But, you know, I think a couple of things when we think about, you know, are we on the investing and saving track, like where we should be at our age, you know, retirement for us is not going to look like even like what it did for our parents, but certainly not our grandparents it's going to look completely different. And 
you know, it's a factor of a how long we're we're going to actually be in retirement. Could be 30 plus years, could be 20 plus years depending on our life expectancy, but we also like want to enjoy life now. We want to do stuff now. We don't want to wait until we're 70 to go travel and to do things. So I think that for a lot of us, we're going to end up working a lot longer, but maybe in a different capacity. But that's just because we're going to start and stop, you know, so many different times along the way with our career. You know, will Social Security be there? I don't know. There's a lot of talk that it won't be. It might be some variation. How long will you live? I don't know. You know, you have to think about your family life expectancy. So if your grandparents are still alive, what about your great grandparents? You know, when did they die? What did they die of? Uh, you know, I know that's a that's a morbid thought, <laughs> not something you want to think about, but I, it is food for thought when we're thinking about you know where are we kind of on the trajectory, and then what you know what will the cost of inflation be? So inflation is literally just you know um, prices increasing. So your your can of soda today is not going to um, cost you the same price that it will even a week from today. That's just the power of inflation. It's it's like when you go grocery shopping and you go to check out and they're telling you it's, you know, a hundred dollars for this like five or six things in your basket. It just doesn't even seem to make sense. And another crazy thing is when we think about the stock market, particularly with millennials, There's a trend of being really conservative and really nervous to invest, to invest in your 401k and your Roth and IRA and a separate investment account, whatever it may be. But did you know that the stock market historically was up about 75% of the time? I think we don't think about that because what we tend to focus on are these big days, these big drops. The 2008 to 2009 was excruciating, horrible. If you were just coming out of college in the job market, you know exactly what I was talking about. If you had money in the stock market, you know exactly what I was talking about. But even just lately, we've had some stock market fluctuations and people tend to get a bit nervous, not sure what to think of it. Well, that is just what happens with the stock market. It contracts and it gets bigger and it contracts and it gets big. You know, it's just the ebb and flow. But the problem is, if you aren't investing your money at all, if your money is just sitting in cash in a checking account or in a savings account, it's not growing. It's not growing anywhere. It's not even keeping up with inflation. In fact, it's not even the same amount of worth the same amount of money than it was yesterday because of inflation. And so your money has to grow somehow. And I don't know what the answer is for you. I don't know if it's real estate I don't know if it's a business. I, I I just don't know what it is for you, but you have to at some point have some toe dipped in the water for your money to grow for the even future hope that, you know, you'll you'll have a pretty decent size of cash sitting in your account. I thought this was also interesting in a recent Allianz life study about generations. The Allianz Generations Ahead story of 3,006 U.S. adults ages 20 to 7 with 20 to 70, sorry, with a minimum household income of $30,000 was commissioned by Allianz Life Insurance Company. They found that 41% of millennials set aside each month for saving, which is on par with the 42% of boomers who do the same and higher than 36% of Gen Xers. And the millennial generation is working harder to earn even more. A growing number, 28%, even had a side job in addition to their main source of income, according to a recent study by Bankrate. So we know this, right? We are, uh, millennials are the side hustle generation, the Uber, the Lyft driver, um, you know, starting online businesses, whatever it may be. It's, it's, it's a generation, I think, of of evolution, of change. There's a lot of change that's happening, and change is good, in my opinion. Change might feel uncomfortable, but I think change is good. But it's also the generation of savers, and I don't, I don't blame you, especially if you're in your early 20s or mid-20s. It, it's kind of a crazy world out there. But I just want you to understand the principle that the money has to grow. It has to get bigger somehow. And the longer you wait for the money to start growing, 
the more money you're going to have to contribute for it to grow. So it just gets more painful down the road. But again, it's just a personal decision. So long story short, let's go back to Jason's question. There are some guidelines, some benchmarks, but again, they don't have to be followed by a rule. So If you're listening to this and you're thinking, I haven't started to save anything. I haven't started putting any money in my 401k or my IRA or my Roth or any other type of account. Don't freak out. It's not a big deal. It really isn't. It's just, again, about having an awareness of where you're at, being the CEO of your own finances, and having some idea of what the vision for your life, what what you're aiming for, what you want it to look like. And that's going to help you figure out how much money you have to save. But in your 20s, you know, aim to save somewhere 25% of your overall gross salary. And that's a combination of 401k, any matching funds from your employer, and then any cash that you might save. So that all goes into the 25%. And you might also include in that debt repayment. Because if you think about it this way, let's say you owe $5,000 on a credit card. And let's pretend the interest rate is 20%. Instead of investing that $5,000, you take that $5,000 and you pay off that credit card in full. Well, you've essentially given yourself a 20% return. That's a big deal. Last time I looked, I didn't get a 20% return in the market. So you can think about paying off debt in that way if you want to include it in that goal mark somewhere around 20 to 25% of your overall gross pay. By age 30, you need to have the equivalent of your annual salary saved. So if you earn $50,000, aim to have $50,000 in saving. Again, these are just benchmarks. They are just goals. And this can include saving in the retirement accounts, matching funds from your company, any cash savings you have, and any other money you have invested anywhere. If you have money in Acorns or any other robo-advisors, Betterment, anything like that, that all is included in that dollar amount. So then we start going up from there, right? By age 35, aim to have around twice your annual salary saved. By 40, have three times. By 45, four times. By 55 times, 55, six times. 67, 67 times, 65, eight times. You get where we're going here. So it just keeps increasing. And the overall goal is that your income is also going to be increasing. So hopefully through your awesome ninja negotiating skills, you're getting pay raises. And when you get a pay raise, it makes a big deal. So let's just look at it this way. Let's say you're 30 and you make $72,000 a year and you put in only 6% of your salary in your 401k and your employer puts in a 3% match. At age 67, if you earned Uh, 6%, you'd have approximately $1.14 million. But let's say you negotiate, because you're such an awesome negotiator, for $1,000 more a month, which brings your salary up to $84,000. Same parameters, you're still earning 6% until age 67. You would have $1.33 million, so almost $200,000 more. And that's just a really small example of how negotiating, earning what you're worth can really make a big difference for you overall. Because when those numbers start to get bigger and that gap starts to get wider, that starts to be a big deal. That starts to add years where you're not running out of money in retirement because that's just the whole goal. But when you're in your 20s, 30s, even 40s, the goal is just to save as much as you can in a 401k, a Roth, IRA, outside investment account, real estate, buy a house, whatever whatever that is for you, the goal is just to keep saving what you can, but saving it in places that are growing. And if it's too nerve wracking for you to start right now investing, you know, think about a high yield interest savings account. You're only going to earn one and a quarter to one and a half percent, but it's something, it's better than zero. And also, lastly, Think about controlling your spending and not have that lifestyle creep. So too many of us, we get a big bump in our pay or or maybe we get some sort of gift given to us or inheritance, whatever it may be. And then our expenses start to get higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And before we know it, like we're making 
you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year and we're spending that much. So we're still living paycheck to paycheck. So the goal is just to figure out how to, it's so simple, figure out how to minimize your expenses, maximize what you're making, and then put it in smart places so it keeps growing. So hopefully, Jason, that answered your question, gave you some sort of guideline. Don't freak out if you're if you're nowhere in those marks. Just keep focus on saving. Hey, I know the snow may still be falling in certain places, maybe where you live, but I'm getting ready for summer with Beachbody On Demand. And I have been using Beachbody On Demand for well over a year now on my own because I just really wanted to be able to work out at home and when I travel, but I wanted to also have access to workouts anywhere I am, from my computer, my phone, to my web-enabled TV. And honestly, I wanted something that was affordable. In just a few short months of working out with their 21 Day Fix program, friends were asking me what in the world I was doing to tone up and lose weight. And you may have heard of some of the Beachbody brands like P90X, Insanity, 21 Day Fix, again, my personal favorite, as well as the Three Day Yoga Retreat, which is a complete new favorite of mine. They have workouts for any level and they range from 10 minutes to over an hour. So you don't need to work out for an hour a day to see results. And there are so many great options, which I love. And it's not just workouts. Beachbody has a ton of nutritional content and workout guides. So you know what to do. Plus, they've become like my one-stop shop for health and fitness goals. Whether you're a serious athlete or you're just looking for something new to work out, to get toned for the summer, you need to give Beachbody On Demand a try. Right now, Millennial Money listeners can get a free trial membership when you text my money, no spaces, so my money to 303030. You get full access to the entire platform for free. Again, just text my money to 303030. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. <laughs> I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. So we've got another great question. This one comes from Kelly. And Kelly says, what are the simple ways to build credit? I recently leased a car and my credit score dropped significantly. I see the chart since I check it once a week for free through my Chase app, Credit Journey. 
I do use my credit card to buy things to earn points. However, because I'm scared to build up debt and have this fear that I'll forget to pay it later, I always pay it off in full at the end of every week. My question is, by doing this, is it hurting my credit score, making payments weekly versus monthly payments when the statement comes out? So before we dive into Kelly's question, which is a great one, by the way, here are a few kind of general questions that were asked by Sarah. Sarah had a lot of general kind of credit questions and wanted to clear the fog on on credit. So Sarah asked, what is a credit score and what are the factors that affect it? If I have a low credit score, how can I improve it? And do the number of credit cards that I have affect my credit score one way or another? So first, we'll tend to Sarah and then we'll get back to you, Kelly. So first with Sarah, a credit score really, for those of us who don't know or just need a refresher, it's a three-digit number that's tied to your social security number and it helps you get credit to buy all the stuff that you want to in life. Simple as that. And there are five main factors for your credit score. Number one is just, do you pay your bills on time? Number two is what amount of available credit are you using? Number three is the length of your credit history. Then we have the mix of your credit types. And then we have how many credit inquiries have you had over a specific period of time? That might sound like a lot of information, but really all you just need to keep in mind is are you paying your bills on time? And are you not using all of the available credit that you have? So for instance, if you have a credit card with, let's say $1,000 of available credit, You should aim to use no more than 30% of that or $300 to keep your credit score booming. Does that make sense? So really, really simple. If those are the only two things you remember about credit score, just remember those. So then she asked, if you have a low credit score, how can you improve it? Great question. A lot of us have been there. You might be there many times throughout your life. There's just a lot of things that happen where your credit score might have some dips. So if you want to improve your credit score, I'd really start again with those those two most important factors because they make up such a big percentage of your credit credit score. It's just, are you paying your bills on time? And are you using no more than 30% of your available credit? A lot of us do. A lot of us tend to use one card more frequently. And really where this comes into play is if you're not paying that credit card off every month. So if you have a $1,000 available credit and you're using $1,000 a month, but you're paying it off every month, the 30% doesn't matter because you're bringing the credit card back to a zero balance. It's for those where you're, you're keeping some debt on the card. That's where it really starts to affect you. Another great tip is a secured credit card. I know those were thought of at least even a few years ago as a real kind of negative thing, like who wants to have a secured credit card? But it really is a great way to boost your credit score. And it's just, it's really just a regular credit card that's secured with a deposit that you make, but it works like any other credit card. Nobody else will know it's a secured credit card but it reports regularly to the credit bureaus, which helps boost your credit score, usually in a matter of just a few months. Usually within six to nine months, your credit score starts getting better and better and better, and then you can move to a regular credit card and kind of get out of that secured credit card. But it's a good method if you're looking at your credit score, you're not happy, and you're looking for a way to make it better, And again, if you're paying your credit cards on time, great. Another thing is just work to try and get those balances down to 30% or less. So Sarah's last question was, do the number of credit cards you have affect your credit score? If so, how and do I care? Great question again. Well, the number of credit cards that can play a role in your credit score, but it might actually surprise you to know that having more credit cards can actually better your score. Say what? Right, because remember, if one of the main factors of our credit score is the amount of credit we're using, let's go back to that, you know, $1,000 available credit card. Let's say we're using $800 of available credit on that card. Our score might be lower than someone who has two credit cards, each with a $1,000 available credit, and they're only using $400 on each, right? So we've got the same balance but now the amount of available credit is larger. We have $2,000 we're playing with rather than just $1,000. So we're able to keep more in that goal range of 30% or less of available credit that we're using. So what does this mean? Well, it often just means that it might, might, might make sense for you to get another credit card that you don't use just to widen that balance between the available credit 
versus the used credit. It's that ratio that you're looking to widen. But you got to know yourself. If you're bad with credit cards, if this is just going to be a big temptation to you, don't do it. Just work to reduce that amount of available credit on the card you have. Work within what you've got. But if you can discipline yourself, if you can not use that card, maybe put it away or treat it like a debit card, you know, uh, this could be a great way to better your credit score, especially if you're thinking about buying a house in the relatively new future, buying a car, anything like that that's a big purchase. You know, and you might be sitting saying, well, I don't even have debt on a credit card and I have one credit card and I'm sure my credit score is great. And then you check your credit score and you're like, wait a minute, my credit score is not that good. Well, it's a factor of not using your credit regularly and also not having a good credit mix because remember that's one of our factors. So by mix, they're talking about things like student loans, car loans, home loans mixed with revolving credit cards mixed with you know, your normal Visa, MasterCard credit cards mixed with, let's say, an Old Navy card or a gas card. It's just a a mix of credit. And it really doesn't make any sense because we're a nation of debt. We're in a lot of debt. And so we're promoting people getting in more debt so that we can have a better credit score so we can buy more stuff. It doesn't make sense. It completely baffles my brain, but it's the system we live in. So we just have to figure out how to beat them at their own rules. Let's get back to Kelly's question. You know, making bi-weekly or even weekly payments is a really popular concept now. It's called micropayments. And there are a couple of pros and cons to paying your credit card this way. One is you can set it your payments close to your pay cycle. So depending if you're paid every week or every other week, you can map out your payments to correspond with your pay cycle so that you're not ever in that situation where you're running out of cash. You can also pay down your credit card debt more quickly in the same way the you know a bi-weekly mortgage works. You can actually turn a 30-year fixed mortgage almost into a 15-year-ish mortgage by just making bi-weekly payments. And you can potentially improve your credit score. You know, the credit card issuers, they typically report your outstanding balance to the credit bureaus monthly. So even if you pay your balance off monthly, if you pay on the 15th and the credit card issue reports on the 1st, you may show as carrying a balance at that particular moment. But these micropayments, they cut the odds that you'll have this big balance showing when the credit card issuer kind of takes your, your credit card snapshot, right, to the bureaus. So if you divide the monthly payment by four and make a payment each week for four payments in a month on a kind of a fixed payment loan, the interest is then calculated for the next month will be no different from making one payment before the due date. Does that make sense? So if we have a fixed payment loan, I'm talking about a loan, and we break our payment up into four payments or two payments, it doesn't make a big difference. But if we make weekly payments on a revolving credit card, aka our credit cards, the interest charge for the next month will be less than if you made a single payment just before the due date. So for credit cards, a smaller interest charge means the minimum payment for the next month will be slightly lower. So we're going in the right direction. We're going lower. But the key is just to continue to make the exact same weekly payments. Your minimum payment will go down, but keep making these same weekly payments until your credit card is is paid off or If you know you use a certain amount of credit every single month, you you can factor that into your budget and you can really break those up into equal payments. So not only are you bettering your credit score and you're paying off that debt, but again, like Kelly was saying, it's keeping her on track. So Kelly, there's really no right or wrong way to do this. I think you've got a great system that works for you. So I keep up with it. Likely what happened when your credit score dropped when you leased a new car is just that might be a different type of credit mix. Uh, Probably if you check your credit score 60, 90 days after you lease that car and you still are, you know, making the payments the way you are, I would expect that your credit score would increase, but not looking at your credit report, you know, I'm just kind of, uh, I'm kind of making an educated guess here. 
But you could also think about, you know, maybe getting an extra credit card for you might be a great strategy, not one that you use, but one that is broadening your mix and one that's giving you more available credit. So just food for thought. Hopefully these questions have resonated with you. Hopefully there's something in in each of these answers where you can pull out and apply it to your own situation. If you got a question, I would absolutely love to hear from you. Link is in the show notes. You can head on over, send me a question. There's no dumb questions. Again, you can remain anonymous if you wish. Make up a name. I don't care. Just ask a question because I will love to answer them. As always, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Shauna Game. And if you love this podcast, do me a favor, share it with your friends. Shout it out on social media. Let everyone know about the podcast. It's how we grow. And it's how we keep getting cool people on the episodes. 